Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Randy Jones, uh, and George Bohannik is up here with, presenting with me. Uh, we are in professional services, uh, part of uh, Esri, and uh, we work with clients um, anywhere from consulting with them about uh, a project that they're working on, might just be design, uh, and we take applications and uh, system architectures all the way into implementation uh, for others. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about building JavaScript applications for production. Uh, when we say building here, uh, what we're really talking about is um, not just best practices around maybe how the server should be configured, uh, but we're looking at how the applications need to be both structured and what we can do to optimize their delivery to the, um, our users' browsers. Um, so who right now is doing a build on their application, either using the Dojo build or maybe um, Webpack in some way? OK, good, OK. Uh, so we will sort of hit through some highlights here of some great best practices, and then we have demo, demo, demo for you. So what we're really looking for is to show you uh, varieties of applications in different states, whether you're starting something new, whether you have an existing one, talk about some web app builder, um, and we'll uh, dive right into this. So there's some things that are always and forever best practices for us. Well until they change. Everything always changes, right? But um, gzip is something that you need on your server. Um, if you don't know how to configure it, uh, look, look um, online. We, I'll, we'll point you to a place uh, for that here in a second. Um, but gzip, what that is going to do is that's going to compress those bytes across the wire. Your file sitting on disk might be 50K, but it might only be 10K across the wire when you've gzipped it. The client can decompress that really fast and then do that. So that can save you money, can save you time. Um, your image sizes. Everybody thinks those images look great, but if you're only going to have it be 25 by 25 on the page, you don't need it to be 600 by 600 on disk, right? So let's save those bytes, save that size. Helps with download speed, helps with download time. Uh, spriting. Spriting is an excellent way to save things as well. Um, spriting is a technique where we take individual images, like um, we're sh showing down here in the bottom, um, and combining them all into a single image, and then using CSS to just show the one that we want. OK? And how does this save this time? We don't have to do round trips to the server over and over and over to get images, e even if they might be cached. Um, and so this can really help um, reduce our request load and do that. And then, and then we, uh, we finally, we have our, um, I'm totally blanking. Blocking here. elements. Oh, yeah, our blocking elements. Sorry. I forgot my own joke here. Uh, so we have our blocking elements. <laughs> uh, so this is where we want to make sure that um, the script tags and the things on our pages, they're going to block us from rendering and from the user being able to uh, interact with the page in some way. Uh, we want to make sure that those are put at the appropriate place on the page, not the bottom, so that as the page is loading and rendering, um, we're going through things. Some other great best practices, um, you can analyze your site using um, Google PageSpeed Insights, Google Lighthouse. Um, so these are two, two great tools. Um, they're run in different ways, and they focus on little different elements of things. Um, PageSpeed Insights, that's a web page. You can go in, you just put in your URL. It'll tell you all the things that are wrong with it, um, whether your images are too big, um, whether your uh, script um, needs to be loaded in a different way. Um, Google Lighthouse, that's built into uh, Chrome developer tools. It has a little more of a security slant on it, I would say. Uh, so using these in conjunction together uh, can really help you improve your site as well. Um, so here's a really uh, good GitHub site here. Um, that will, no matter whether your server is IS or Apache or Nginx, is a great way to make sure that you are using an optimized set of configuration for your web server. So that's going to help you uh, deliver your content to the users. Um, 
in a, uh, the most efficient way possible. That GZIP compression that we were talking about earlier um, is just one of those many things that can help you with that, cache settings, et cetera. Uh, so George is gonna start uh, talking to us now um, about uh, our applications and how we get the build build part uh, into this. All right, thank you. You wanna switch me over there? All right, so the single largest change that we've found when you're moving your application into production is to build everything out. And what we mean when we say building things out in a production application, we're talking about compressing all of the JavaScript files and bringing them down into individual layer files. So when we're developing, we're looking at many different JavaScript files. We like to keep things encapsulated, separated, everything like that. But for every network request that you load from the browser, you're going to take a hit on performance. So bringing those things together, really limiting your network requests, drastically improves performance. Generally, we've leveraged the toolings that come with Dojo. Um, this is a great process. It makes apps significantly faster. We generally see jumps close to 50% in performance after we run a build. Um, so it's not some small tweak here. Uh, that being said, it is kind of a monster to run. Um, you know, it eats your CPU pretty heartily. It doesn't really play nice with other, um, other frameworks and some of the new modern toolings that are coming out. So the, um, the newer solution here is Webpack. Uh, how many people here have heard or tried playing around with Webpack before? Okay, great. So Webpack is really great. It speeds things up significantly. Um, we found that the file sizes end up being around the same, the number of requests are around the same. Um, but we've actually found that Webpack with the, uh, the most recent uh, plugins and toolings we use can load these things a little faster just by smart loading. We're gonna switch over here. We have a version of um, the same application, and this is an application we built uh, to just kind of test out some of these built things. It's a legacy style application, so it's not using the latest patterns. It's, uh, it's using things like digit templates. It's using things that have been around for a really long time. Uh, but it's, and it's got some features, right? We have a drive time tool. We can show and hide layers, and uh, you know, various things like that. Click on the map, get a pie chart. Uh, and you can see on the right there the different requests. Is that the... Uh, this is the Dojo. So this one was built using the Dojo uh, build toolkit. And you can see there it's got pretty good load time. It's got small amount of files. But compared to the Webpack build, they're pretty close. So it's kind of, you know, pretty similar. Either one you're running will be good. Um, switch me over back. Here. Uh, the main thing you're going to consider, if you're already using the Dojo build on your projects, you have a large project, you've invested time into getting the Dojo build working, you probably don't need to rush and switch over to Webpack just yet. Um, if you're using 3.x, Webpack's not going to work for you. And if you're using a version of the JavaScript API before 4.7, Webpack's not going to work for you. Here's just some links that work with it. Uh, to get Webpack working, there's a few things you have to do. You have to configure some files. Um, first thing is we're gonna have to bring some dependencies into our project. So we're gonna do this using NPM. Um, these are some of the examples you'll probably use. Uh, the main one being down there at the bottom is the ArcGIS Webpack plugin. Uh, that's really the bread and butter that lets it work with Dojo that lets the JavaScript API still load some components in a way it needs to, and service workers, things like that. The other things at the top are more standard um, developer toolings that you might see with any, any other Webpack app. So we have a task to clean the distribution directory. We have a task to copy static files. Um, you know, that could be a config JSON. It could be some images, things like that. Um, or just things that were loaded in more of a legacy manner. Uh, we have CSS, HTML loaders, uh, and we have a dev server that'll let us run as we make changes, it'll be running the build. And that's one of the really great things about 
using Webpack versus the Dojo build, right? When you're using the Dojo build, it's more of something that happens at the end. You're done, you've finished your sprint, you have a lot of new features, you push it out, you run the build, your test server. Uh, Webpack has options to run in development mode, which compresses a little bit less, but runs more quickly. And it'll be running as you're developing and refreshing your pages as you go. So it can be a much cleaner uh, development environment. And I'll get into the, uh, the code in a little bit, just wanted to give an overview first. Uh, some tips that we found as we go through, uh, particularly with older applications, um, you know, we don't get the privilege of starting new applications from scratch every day, um, pretty rarely actually. So getting these newer toolings into older applications can be a little more difficult, but I still think the, uh, the benefits definitely outweigh working with some of the pains. A um, Couple quick things, relative paths are generally easier when you're integrating Webpack for the first time. So whereas previously you might have had um, you know, your project name, like my project slash site manager, or my project slash toolbar, we generally use uh, the relative paths from our entry point. Um, there's a little trick for digit templates or if you're using Dojo text, you have to uh, add some text replace things so that Webpack can handle it. Uh, that's really just a copy and paste sort of thing. So you can pull out, um, you can download this repo and just copy and paste it. Um, it's the Dojo text lo plugin loads in, a, uses a similar syntax as uh, Webpack to determine which uh, plugin to use. So you have to kind of force it. And then um, for static config files, uh, it's best to just copy those directly. So let's take a look at what all this actually looks like here. I've got, first of all, I've got my package.json, and that is something you might see. We have some NPM test scripts here that'll let us run our tests. It'll let us um, run a dev server that's what I was talking about earlier when I was said it's gonna refresh our page as we make changes. And then we have a production build as well. And we have all our dependencies that were part of that last thing. In order to configure Webpack, uh, it all centers around this Webpack config and that's webpack.config.js. Goes in the root of your project here. Um, you know, Webpack is built around plugins. So we have the ArcGIS plugin. Again, that's the special sauce that's gonna make uh, the JavaScript API run correctly. And then we have a number of other ones. Uh, you specify where your root files are. So in your project, the, uh, the entry points are going to be um, where you've actually loaded your first requirements. So in this project, we have um, In this project, we have index.js, and if I pull up index.js, we can see it in turn pulls this site manager and just runs a quick initialization function. The site manager itself then has a number of requires, so that's loading a lot more, right? We've got the map, we've got the map view, all of the standard things you would expect. Uh, info grid, some custom toolings there. And that webpack goes through pulls each of those requirements and brings it into bundle files. So if I go in here and I say that I want to start my dev server, it can, it's gonna go forward, it's gonna start compiling them all together, and it's gonna work through these plugins one by one. So let's just take a look at what it's actually doing here. Um, the first plugin is going to be a clean webpack plugin, so that's going to delete anything I have in a distribution folder. Uh, that's not really something we have to worry about in dev. Then we have a copy webpack plugin. That's gonna go ahead and copy everything I have in data and images into a static folder. We have that replace I was talking about for dealing with templates. And then we have the ArcGIS plugin that's gonna go and build the JavaScript API. We have something that's gonna insert everything back into our index.html, our CSS, and our CSS processing finally. We have some rules here that just uh, help configure the actual templates names. And you can see it takes a little bit to run. Usually the first time you run it, it takes a little bit longer. But once that's done, 
it pulls up and it runs on localhost 8081. Uh, every time you make a change, that's gonna refresh. And then you can go through here, take a look at the changes. All right. So that's great and all if you're using legacy applications. But let's say you're starting up a new application. Uh, you don't want to go through that extra work. You just want to use your best practices. Uh, we don't want to do all that work ourselves. There's no reason to. Uh, you know, other people have done this. Other people are going to go through, figure out the best practices, and you want to apply lessons learned from where you were, and you want to apply lessons learned from the entire dev community, right? So using a CLI to scaffold out your applications really takes that onus off you to try to figure out, okay, how do I get this initial setup, something that I only have to do maybe once every three years, once every quarter if I'm working on a lot of small apps, things like that. And it lets you build that out with the, most, with the best practices in a modern way. For that, we're gonna take a look at using the ArcGIS CLI. So this is a application that spins up new um, ArcGIS JavaScript applications with Webpack, with unit tests, with everything set up. It's using TypeScript. All of those toolings are ready to go. And you don't have to worry about them. So let's look at that code. Uh, this one takes a really long time to actually get started, so I'm not going to run here. But what I would do is I'd just say uh, ArcGIS create and I can say, let's say, Dev Summit 2019. And that's going to go through. It scaffolds everything out. Uh, if we look, this is one I ran earlier today. And you can see the, uh, the source directory here. All of this. Oh, thank you so much. All right. That's a little better, huh? Okay, so the scaffolding directory, you can see here all of the source. Um, it's running a little further. It runs npm install after it goes. Uh, we have our config.typescript, that's all the different TypeScript config. We have down here that webpack config that I was talking about earlier. Uh, this one's a little different. It works directly with the package as it's meant to be set up. We have our entry file. And we have the widgets set up in a very modern way, right? They're using TypeScript. They're using this sort of um, TSX file that lets you use uh, return HTML directly from your render function. Uh, this is a really great way to include templates in your application. Works very well with Webpack, with all the other modern toolings. Uh, things like integrating into frameworks, you'll see a lot of things like this. Um, but Really, this is an easy way to get started. You don't have to be Googling a million things, and you can just go knowing that you're using the best practices already. It's kind of similar to what Randy was talking about earlier with those server configs. Let someone else figure that stuff out and just so you can work on the, the uh, processes that are specific to your organization. All right. So what about Web App Builder? All right, Web App Builder is, um, you know, kind of a, akin to the JavaScript API, right? It's, um, it's a strong application with a number of widgets already built out. Um, it's we're using 3x, so there's no way we're going to use Webpack for that. Uh, we have a tool that runs the Dojo build on widgets or applications that you've built with Web App Builder. Uh, that's going to, again, really decrease your size. <coughs> One thing to note when you're running this build, when you're running Dojo builds, do not run them on production servers. They use a lot of C CPU and really eat up your system resources. All right, and with that, Randy's gonna talk about pulling all of this into production in more of an automated way and how you can really integrate into your source control and get things running smoothly. So continuous integration is a, it's a way for us to bring all this goodness together. We have our application, we have it building with Webpack or the Web App Builder uh, build, and, but 
we still are taking a lot of time now to take that application, make sure it's packaged correctly, go deploy it to a server. Um, you know, it, and it just takes longer for us to then get an application into production. Um, the great thing about continuous integration here for us is um, we're able to use these servers. Really, these things aren't much more than like task schedulers that can be kicked off from um, a commit, can be run on a schedule. You know, it's, you're gonna have to know what meets your needs and um, the quality assurance process that you have set in place. You know, maybe you wanna make sure that your QA people don't have the application replaced on them every 15 minutes because you're committing, right? They get angry if you do that. So, so you wanna establish those practices that are gonna be good for you. Um, so there's lots of options out there. Uh, Travis CI and Jenkins and Circle CI, they are popular ones. Um, there's a number of them out there. Uh, and a lot of them are integrated into some of the platforms now as well um, that you might be using. So uh, today we're gonna talk about Jenkins. I love it because it's free. It has a really robust ecosystem. Um, and one of the things that I love about it is uh, the pipelining feature that it has. And other, other CIs have uh, the pipelining feature as well. Um, so as we, um, as we move over here, uh, I just wanna show you uh, Jenkins here to start with. This is what the dashboard looks like. Uh, you can see I have a few uh, jobs uh, set up already. Uh, one's to look at the application that George started with for us, the uh, custom application. Uh, we've compared it both running uh, it with the Dojo build and with the Webpack build. And then we also have a project here running uh, with the Web App Builder. Uh, so if we come look at what one of these pipelines looks like, uh, you can see I have a number of steps here. I have to go get my code. We're gonna test the code. This is important, like we can know almost immediately if somebody checked in bad code that is failing unit tests, if somebody checked in bad code that is failing like JS hint or uh, ESLint, whichever of those options uh, you're using in your code, uh, TSLint if you're using uh, TypeScript. And once we know that we're passing the, that basic function of the unit test, only then do we really go to build our application and start pushing it into testing to make it toward production. So right now I have uh, my uh, custom Dojo application. Uh, I have it deployed here to my QA server that I have running on 8080 here on my machine. Um, we can reload it. I, I can see that uh, my application is working. Uh, maybe it was the, the high transportation feature that I just added that I wanted to check out. Uh, you know, so from my perspective, this is good. Uh, we can pretend that the QA has, been, has uh, been completed on this now. And what you can see here is in my pipeline, I have this step this, in this paused state. It's waiting to deploy it to production until I'm telling it that it's ready. So I can do, I, it has two options for me here. I can abort this, maybe I found something wrong and I, I don't want it to keep moving all that way. You know, or I can, I can tell it to proceed and tell it to go ahead and uh, deploy to production. Uh, so we're gonna do that. You can see from the previous job, um, it only took a couple seconds to do that. Um, so now uh, we're at five seconds, and, and my production uh, application runs over on uh, 8081 here for, for our demonstration purposes. And you can see applications running, it's looking great. So my burden to get this application in production by using the toolings um, that I built within the application to deploy automatically to my web server. This could easily be S3 because this could easily be a copy and a paste to a place on server. Uh, I'm using Tomcat in this case as my backend web server and we're deploying it through the manager application here as well. Um, so what does that actually look like? If we look at, um, if we look at our job here, um, this is one of the nice things, we can, we can replay it. And the good thing about the Jenkins pipeline here is everything lives in my source code repository. So that means that if my server dies, 
all I have to do, set up my continuous integration server, check it back out, and it's ready to roll. So you can see here we have a few commands that run each time, and these should be familiar commands from what George was doing earlier. You just see we're running npm installs to get all of our dependencies. Um, in this case, we're using grunt as a as a uh, as a task runner, and the test task kicks off, kicks off a bunch of karma tasks in our case here. And then we have the build step. We saw that before. Um, Jenkins has some durability things where if like uh, the same job doesn't necessarily have to run on the same server if you have multiple nodes going on. So I'm just going to do an npm install again, make sure that all my dependencies are there. Um, in this case, this is the old Dojo version of what we were showing. So uh, that back uses Bower to pull all the dependencies together from the JavaScript API. And then we're doing the grunt build, and we're zipping it up. And again, I'm stashing that war away. Because like I said, it might get deployed by some other Jenkins node somewhere if I have a more complex configuration. We're deploying it to QA. And uh, then we're, we're waiting for that. Uh, we have a milestone here that's telling us we want to wait uh, for the user input to, to uh, know if we're going to deploy. And you can see finally then we're deploying here uh, over onto port 8081. So this, is, this way we can take our applications, we can do this build goodness, get them fast, get them tested and get them into production faster than we ever could before. Um, and so this is a great workflow, uh, this is a great tool uh, that you might invest in, and like I said, it's, it's free. That, that's one of the great things about uh, Jenkins here. Um, so we have this application, um, we have it in production now. Uh, what about a web app builder situation? Web app builder apps are more complex. It, most people are probably using the developer edition if they're creating something more complex that they're deploying, not just using it within portal, right? Or the application in portal is really sluggish. You add lots of widgets, you have a really heavy application. This is where the web app builder build is going to make our apps start to shine. Um, so we, I have this, uh, my portal here running on my box. Uh, we have a web app builder application here. Thankfully this one's really small, but you can see that it's, it's pretty bare bones. So how do we structure the web app builder applications with our project so that we can have the speed of getting things to production, the ease of upgrading web app builder versions, and get the goodness of the build all at once, okay? So when we start looking at this, there's going to be a few lines here on the screen. Stay with me for a minute. George and Gavin are going to be talking about the Yeoman generator part of this on uh, Thursday evening. I think it's 5.30 is that session. Yeah, so right before the party. Right before the party. You're real close to where the party's going to be. I think it's this room. Yeah, it might be. Either that or the next door. Yeah, so uh, easy access to the party. It will be a great session for you to attend, especially if you're doing custom web app builder um, projects. So the Yeoman generator is stuff just like we showed the CLI. It's going to scaffold out all the stuff that you need. That means it's going to create all those things and put the project in the good structure for you uh, for you to build your web app builder widgets, okay? So we have that, and what I'm going to use is I'm going to use a grunt task to copy my widgets into a dev edition of the web app builder. You know, I'm just going to create a project there, I'm going to have that running there. So now I have my widgets over in there, but what about the config part of my application? Because, because of those widgets, and I want to reuse those in multiple projects. Maybe I even host it as, a, as an option for people to use within uh, my portal as a configurable widget. So I'm going to separate out the config part as well. So now we, we have two projects that we're going to put under source control. We have the widget part and we have our config part. And remember, the widget part we're going to use in many projects, hopefully, and the config part is the one that's specific to this project, okay? So similarly, we're going to use the grunt task to first 
copy those configs into our web app builder project and then we're going to um, watch them for changes because we're going to edit that config within the web app builder dev edition just like you would any other web app builder app you know add a new widget in the in one of the buttons or, or change the theme and so then we'll copy that back to our project and then similarly we have it on the widget side the widget side we're going to edit our widget project and it's going to move live into our web app builder um, and so, so let's actually look at what this looks like. Thanks. So the first thing I'm going to do is we have our Web App Builder widget project, and. Uh, by default, my gr the grunt tasks that I have running in this one, um, you can see it's going to copy my uh, my files over, and this is this is the grunt file that's created as a part of the uh, scaffolding out. So it's going to, if it's TypeScript, it's going to apply the the Babel to it and all that goodness, uh, so that you can uh, use TypeScript to, uh, to create your widgets. So we have that, and we then we have our config project. Um, we look over here and um, when we look at our config project, uh, we have a number of files in here that we have. Things that you are used to being, used to seeing, we have our package JSON with all of our dependencies. Um, but most importantly, we have our app configs. So I have the app configs here in a folder. Um, you can see we have the normal config JSON. Uh, you can see it's, it's nice and uh, uh, compact JSON up here. Um, and then we also have the other configs. Uh, we have the configs for the custom widget that I created. You can see that I've also added the bookmark widget as a part of it. Um, so I need that config as well. Uh, so we have a terminal here. Um, let's go ahead and we will do uh, grunt copy and we'll apply our config and then we'll also, we'll start our watch as well. So this only takes a, a couple seconds to, to run and, um, oh, that would do it. Let's see here. So when we originally created this project, I created it using the 2.7 version of the API. Um, and so what I'm currently running today though is uh, the 2.11 version of the Web App Builder application. Uh, so you can see it copied our directories over, it copied my files over, and if we come in here and we refresh our application, you can see we have a new title now my widgets are showing up. So it was that, because I encapsulated my code and my configurations into the proper um, places, it was really easy for me to bring it all back together into the latest version of the Web App Builder. So now that we have the Web App Builder, how do we actually get this application that's now configured into production for us? I have a Jenkins file here that's been created. And much like the other one, we have a couple steps here. We have a build step, and then as the others are familiar, we can deploy it to QA and we can deploy it to production. So very similarly to what we have seen before, um, we have some copying around of the thing. So this is where I'm taking those um, separate things and I'm bringing them together. I'm using a Web App Builder app that has every single widget in it. Every single widget. Why is that? Because I have no idea what's going to be in my configuration. And I'm going to let the build take care of choosing the pieces that I need. Okay? So my production app is only going to have what I need, but I need to start with everything on the Web App Builder side. So then I've pulled in my custom widgets, and we're copying over the configuration as well. 
Um, and you can see the build output of here is gonna be a zip file that we're then going to uh, deploy into Tomcat. So if we come back over into Jenkins to see what this begins to look like as a pipeline, we can see our web app builder project here. Um, and, and I have one that's on hold, ready to go to production. Um, so you can see the pipeline being executed here. Uh, one of the nice things about Jenkins, we can come in here, we can see all the gr nitty gritty details here. Um, so you can see this log is pretty big. We have the dojo build in this case um, in a verbose mode. So you can see it really, so we can dig in here and really see all the things that are going on with the build. Um, it checks it out of the code repository, starts to bring everything together and you can see it's copying the files around uh, before it then starts the dojo build. And then it clean, and then we have it so it cleans up itself. So this gets rid of all that stuff that you don't need anymore. So when we look at this uh, web app builder application, we have our web app. And you can see it, it has um, all the goodness here. And has anybody seen a web app builder application load that fast before? Um, the web app builder itself is a great framework, but because of the way that they've architected the flexibility in the widgets and the themes in that configuration, it's not always the most efficient application. So this build really gives that to us. So we've seen this and we saw the Jenkins file, but one thing you might notice in the Jenkins file is we just do an npm run build call. What does that call look like? So when we come into, back into our package, we can see that we have a number of uh, scripts like George uh, was pointing out about one of our other projects um, earlier. And what's different about this one is in addition to the grunt task to watch things, um, we've also set it up as an example of how you might do that in NPM as well. So the build task itself is here is this last script one. And you can see it's a really simple command. It's Esri Wab build my app. And that app is the folder that all of my things have been copied into. So once you install that Esri Wab build, which is really simple via just a straight NPM command, um, as George, you showed that in the slides, right? The link. Yeah, the, the link's link. up on the slides. So the link is totally up in the slides, and we have a resource slide at the end to show you exactly where that is. So it's really easy to install, it's a single line, and then you can see just how easy it is to run on a Web App Builder project. So if you were to download one out of the Web App Builder Developer Edition, you don't have to set up all this stuff that we have with the multiple um, you know, config versus uh, custom widgets. You can just download one out of the Web App Builder application, navigate to that folder on the command line, and run Esri Web Build in your, app, in your folder. And that's it. You'll end up with a production ready Web App Builder application. Yeah, and I mean, if you already have an app that you're using and you don't want to worry about changing anything, maybe it's been running in production for a while, you're not doing much development, and you just want to speed it up you can just run this tool on existing apps as well. Yep, so we'll show, um, with this Web App Builder app, uh, I don't have it running into uh, production yet. We can come, come in here and uh, deploy it to production and uh, get it all the way there um, in the same way that we did with our custom application. Um, knowing that this one in particular is set up in that way where we have our configuration, our custom uh, widgets, and our um, application from Web App Builder, it's all coming together. So our web app is successfully deployed uh, and we are ready uh, for our users to, to come and use the application. So here we are, we're showing that uh, pipeline 
this is sort of a, a nice visual way to, to see this um, when we're looking at it from um, the web app builder perspective. Um, we have those projects like we talked about, we have the dev edition, we're using Jenkins to get that through, uh, make our uh, war in this case since we're deploying it to uh, Tomcat, um, but we could just as easily, uh, like I said, deploy this to S3, deploy this to Apache, deploy this to IES. So there are uh, some related talks. Um, George and I are giving a unit testing talk uh, with the JavaScript API tomorrow, um, just after lunch in the room next door, I believe it is, Kalina and Madeira. And then do you want to give any additional plug on this one? Yeah, sure. This will be more, um, we talked about the build aspect a little bit and integrating into more of a production environment here. This is going to be more focused around the development environment of Web App Builder. So we'll be talking about best practices for writing your widgets, uh, best practices for writing unit tests for Web App Builder, and just really an overview of things we found to work really well in production uh, Web App Builder development workflows. So we've given a similar talk for a couple of years now. Every year we really do take uh, your feedback, which will be the next slide, um, and we integrate that into our talk for the next year. This year we tried to go more demo heavy based on your feedback from last year, um, but I still think that there's a lot of um, good nuggets in that 2018 presentation as well that you might be interested yeah, I'd in. I'd say the, the 2018 presentation focused more on the, uh, the pieces at the front, um, really looking at those uh, generic web performance techniques mm -hmm. versus the specific pipelines into production that we talked about today. Yep, so if you're looking for more information, Lighthouse, um, the ArcGIS Webpack plugin, um, those are the links for you there. Um, the Esri Web App Builder build is there. Um, as George likes to say, we take uh, pull requests. So yep. if you want to help us improve it, keep things up to date, um, we would love to, to yeah. see you do that. And everything we've been talking about today is in GitHub. So we do really do mean it when we say we appreciate your help on that. If you know you see something that could be improved, if you found something that works really well for you, if you just can't get it to work, period, and you're like, man, those guys were full of smoke and mirrors. They just kind of showed us some screenshots and videos. This is dumb. Uh, feel free to just leave an issue, and we can try to figure out what's going on with your app. Um, if you want to switch over to my screen, I can show some of the, uh, the repos here that yep. didn't get up on there. Oh yeah, sure. And the uh, the last one that I had up here a second ago was the ArcGIS JS uh, CLI. Uh, Rene did that. He's been giving an, a number of talks uh, this week. If you're not already sold on a framework because your shop is a React shop or an Angular shop or whatever, if you're not opinionated about a framework, you know you need a new custom app, the ArcGIS JS CLI is a great choice to get you unit testing, get you um, the build straight out of the box. It is going to be 4.10 um, based, okay? So it's going to be 4x based. If you know you need something in 3x still for some reason, um, then you know you would need to look at a different option um, from the build and tooling perspective. All right. So this is the uh, this is the web widget section of what Randy was talking about. Uh, it's a very simple widget, but you, you can look in and see how he set up the project, everything like that. Similarly, there's the web config right over here. And then the, uh, the big one we have that we've been maintaining for a while, just to really give it that legacy app feel, is this uh, enterprise build sample JS. And that's got, um, it's got some unit tests in here. It's got um, a Jenkins pipeline. The, uh, the Webpack configuration for a larger application, all of that. Uh, you can see we have a branch for Webpack as well as a branch for the Dojo build. So if you're looking to get something working with the Dojo build, something in Webpack just isn't running right for you, you can roll with that and take a look at what we've done there. Or, or if you're in an older version of the API, the Dojo build is there, right? Because uh, we did, uh, as we mentioned, 4.7 and above is where that Webpack um, plugin is going to start working for you. All 
All right, and like Randy said, we really, uh, we really do take this feedback seriously. Uh, we try to change this talk significantly every year so that we're touching on different topics and people that came last year can still, uh, still gain something out of the talk year to year. But uh, if there was something you really liked about that we talked about and you think would be helpful again and again, definitely let us know. If there was something you didn't like, let us know that too. And we can uh, take a look and change things for next year. Uh, with that, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, in the back. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, how do you handle different environment configurations as you're moving from QA to production, test, staging, things like that? And uh, the answer there is, uh, at least what we usually do, is we have separate configuration files, and then we'll have options in the build that can replace to point at one of those configuration files. And you can just store all of those configuration files right there in GitHub. Uh, for things that are a little more, uh, more sensitive and machine specific, you can store them directly on the server and just make sure they're in your git ignore file so you never accidentally upload them to git. Yeah. Expanding on the idea of the Jenkins pipeline, in that production deploy step, all I would merely do is take my artifact of code that I know is good and I would replace the configuration file first before I go deploy it. Is that that help? Great. I think there was one up here. Yep. Yep. Is there, um, for the Esri Web build, um, is there a minimum version of the web that need to be using? So the question is for the Esri Web build, is there a minimum version? That is a great question. So <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, the latest release has been tested at 2.11. Uh, if you find it doesn't work for your version, let us know, put an issue in. Yeah, we're at 2.4. Okay. Okay. One thing you can do too is um, we can look at making branches for you for older versions that we have, and may go back in that commit timeline. So, may if you can you go on and make a make an issue on the repo? We, we did actually. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, I think the I think the initial time that we created that it was after two four. Oh really? Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, but it might be something simple, so we can take a look. Usually what happens from version to version, the only thing we have to change is there's a uh, dojo profile that lists out all of the, um, the main classes that Web App Builder uses, and a lot of times new ones might be added or yeah. things might be taken away version to version, and we just have to adjust that. It's like a missing include <coughs> or something under Jimu. Yeah, so it's probably just adding that to that profile file. Yeah, there was, I think, uh, moment is the common one that seems to be coming in and out a little bit on us. Were there any other questions? Yes. So you're talking about in the in the dojo uh, build profile, the uh, include set of files that we have that maybe you wouldn't expect because you are, would think the dependency tree would would find them. Is that sort of what we're driving at? Yeah, so, so the reason in the dojo build that we um, specifically include a number of the JavaScript API uh, files there is the way that they lazy load a number of those, um, we decided that we wanted to include them in the dojo file that's built. 
Yeah, um, and you, you can see here the, uh, this is the current layer yeah. file. Is this the one you're using? Similar, probably. So this is kind of like what we found to be the bare minimum. The, uh, the only thing that's really specific to our project here is that one right at the top, the uh, build project slash site manager. And you would just replace that with your entry point on your class. Everything else we found uh, doesn't quite load right unless you include it manually. But um, you shouldn't need any additional Esri classes in there. It should just be pulling it in from that dependency tree. Okay. Um, oh yeah, the the resource. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. R Renee's resource repository. Okay. Yeah, I think I think part of that was to just give a, give like a sample of if you wanted to use things in an HTML file, maybe you didn't want to have it go through the whole tree definition and give you some uh, an idea of how it works, basically. So you don't need all of those Esri files in there. Yeah. So, so this is this example is from that enterprise app that uh, we've been using. So um, it, you might see if you can pare down that list and see if this works for you still. All sort of depend on what features you're using and and whether you would need them or not. But yeah, I mean, obviously, that's a pretty, the smaller the better. Yeah, that's a pretty easy one to debug too, right? You just delete all of the packages, and when you get an error about a specific package, add it back in, right? Well, it's not too much. <laughs> Yeah, so if you really, uh, if you really want to test your build to see that it's doing what you want it to do, uh, take out that reference to the uh, JS API CDN. And so that way it can't make requests or disconnect from the internet and see if you can still load your application. Yep. I think there was a question over here. Does the So the question was, does the Dojo build only work on widgets? And by widgets, I assume you mean the digit widget? Uh, that's why I say you build a custom widget and you can do the host to someone else to point the board. Could you build just that widget? And that would be nice to Yeah, you yeah. could. So the Dojo build, what it's doing is it's, uh, it's just looking at that require statement and just kind of packing that all into one thing. So yeah, you could do that. And then you would just, um, but you would want to make sure that's getting saved to uh, widget.js. Uh, web app builder is obviously very particular about where the files are, are and where they're loading. Yeah, like if we look at this as an example, um, you know, you see we're packaging it into Dojo Dojo here, so that means it's going to write out it to Dojo JS. But you can see we have the boot true there, which it means it's going to have all the extra stuff related to the loader. So if you were to change that to like your widget and then just have the include be your widget and you know, if you had any lazy loading dependency similar to this, um, you know, you would do that and you could. Yeah, one other a thing that file. you might want to look out for if you're doing that, you don't want to load too much, right? Uh, so you can make a separate layer here that has a number of things you know are going to be loaded by the web app builder, uh, more of the generic Esri type classes. And then you just add a flag to, um, to this dojo, not to dojo dojo, but to your widget section. And you can say excludes and that other layer name, and it'll assume it already has access to those classes and it won't include them in the build. Yep. And I think there was one over here. Yep. Um, when you were saving your project, when the application, um, you're saving the configs, mm -hmm. um, and you bring those over into the web app builder or server apps directory to create the application, can you go into more detail about how are you just, are you, is it creating the application from scratch in web app builder? Sure. The, that's a great. That's a great question because we sort of glazed over that part of it. Really, what I did to set up that application first was I just went into Dev Edition, new application, uh, and then I went into it on disk and I went into the um, the client um, section of the Web Builder folders. Literally copied all the widgets back over into the application, not touching the config file in any way, uh, but just putting those folders there. So the widget code is there. And then um, you, this example was really showing um, that case of I'm sort of starting over 
on my project, right? So um, in that case, then we're just copying the config files that we had from the previous time that we were working on it over into it, right? And so I guess what I'm getting to is I, if, I, if I create a project and I'm storing my configs in, mm -hmm. in my repo and developer B or C comes, it comes to the point then that's not really, they've got to accept them all together, right? And do that sort of manual uh, yeah, I, I mean, and it's easy enough to uh, either set that grunt default task to be exactly what I put in there. So um, in that example, I actually have the default task only being the watch part of it, so it'll copy it back over. But if you have more people where you're more commonly um, uh, both editing the config file, saving it, you know, doing a pull from git and need to reapply it, you can certainly put both of those tasks together in the default and just say grunt and have it both apply the, conf the latest set of configs from your, and then start watching for changes that you might be making. Yeah, I'd say to, to add on to that, there's no reason you actually have to go through and register in the GUI, make a new app like that. If you find you're spinning up new developers to work on your web app builder application all the time, you want to really streamline that. You could just zip up, you know, this master project that has all the themes, all the widgets, and have them copy it to their folder and point it right at that. And they can just run the web build on that because the web build right is going to take down, all, not going to load all those widgets. It might be a little bit bigger, but in the end, it'll be faster. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So, and maybe this is a dumb question, but when, when you utilize that D G zip, I mean, do you actually deploy the zip file to the web server, or do you unpack it? Yeah. So, so G zip compression is what we're going to use between the server, like our web server, whether it's IES or uh, it could be Tomcat, but it's more likely to be IES or Apache or uh, like Nginx. Um, and the user's browser. So the pipeline between there, on the fly, the web server will compress the files coming out into gzip format, and then the, the browser will be able to unpack it. The browser actually sends a message to the server upon request saying, hey, I can accept gzip. Um, and so the zip file there at this very end is, this is actually the byproduct of the build. Yeah, so the build, so this is normal zip file like you normally think of. And uh, when I said war earlier, so war files, jar files, like all these fancy file extensions, they're just zip files. And so uh, the war file is just a zip, special zip file. This is just representing the, the war file that was. Yeah, it sits on the web server. You don't have to unzip it. Yeah, so no, 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 with yeah. Tomcat, how, yeah. how uh, it handles it is it'll just automatically unzip yeah. it for you and deploy. Yeah. Um, whereas gzip is more specifically uh, something that happens for transit, and that's going to happen on those individual files. It's usually like a one line config in your IIS or Apache. Yeah, the other big place that gzip is used is more in the Linux world, like, you know, a, a gzip tar. All right, any more questions? Yeah. No, if I needed to do something like really customized, would it, would it make sense to just like start an app with the web app builder and then just take the code from that and modify it? So the question is, if you want to do a heavy customization, so does it make sense to modify something you've already just created using the GUI? Uh, and I'd say that depends on what you're modifying. Are you modifying widgets, or are you trying to go in and modify more? Uh, I would need to have a radial menu, which I don't think the widgets would support. Like a theme? Um. OK. Yeah, I mean, so there's no reason you can't just download an app and start working with it. I would say when you start to get into heavier customizations, right, if you start to look at the map manager, the config manager, that may be a sign that web app builders maybe not the right answer, that you want to start looking at the 4x JP, JS API and building with that. Um, you know, upgrades are going to be a huge pain for you if you start getting into those classes. Yeah, but if you're able to do it with, within the widget side of the house, it could be a good choice. All right. Yeah. So I think we're at time. Uh, George and I are happy to stay around for a few more minutes. If you have uh, other questions, feel free to come up. Uh, we'll also be at the island um, 
almost all day tomorrow, uh, except for the presentation times. Um, the or JavaScript shortly, therefore. Uh, yeah, and we're at the JavaScript island this week. Thank you all. <laughs>